All right, thank you everyone for coming tonight. I'd invite you to come in and have a seat, and we're going to get started with our, our formal program. I trust you had an opportunity to go visit the tables and, and uh, get some more information, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for our community conversations on healthcare. We're excited to be able to share some of the work that's happening in the province and in this community, and to have the opportunity for you to be able to ask some questions from our health leadership team and get some answers and solutions. My name is Nancy mcconnell Maxner. I work for Nova Scotia Health, and I'll be moderating tonight. I want to mention a couple things to start with. One, I just want to mention that this portion of the event will be recorded, so people who want to watch it later can watch it, or people that were not able to attend on this rainy night can watch uh, at their leisure on the same uh, site that you registered on. As we get to the formal question and answer portion, we'll go over a couple of things that we're hoping to achieve through that tonight. And so for now, I will pass it over to uh, the Honorable Tori Rushton, the Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables and the MLA for Cumberland South. It's Tori here when I'm at home. Test, there, there we go. So welcome everyone. I, I do have a script, but uh, the minister said I didn't have to stay on it. So. So that's fantastic, but uh, thank you everyone for being here. I know the weather's, the weather's not that great uh, tonight, but uh, the, there, were, there were a lot of registrations that came in and uh, it's great that it's videotaped so we can watch it at a later date. But uh, I just wanna welcome everyone here tonight. Uh, thank you for coming. And just uh, take a few minutes and introduce, uh, introduce our guests here tonight. And uh, to, my, to my far right, uh, my good colleague, uh, Minister uh, Michelle Thompson, who, uh, we, we work together quite well. I mean, this I think this is your fifth visit uh, since being uh, elected, and uh, we're always welcoming here in Cumberland County, so thank you very much for coming tonight. And uh, her also uh, here with us tonight is the interim CEO for uh, Nova Scotia Health and uh, Karen Oldfield, and uh, always a pleasure to, to welcome you here to Spring Hill. So so what is going to take place is they're, they're going to do a little bit of an introduction, and I believe then we're going to go into, into some Q&As and uh, hopefully have a, pro a, a progress that uh, will answer some questions in the community and, and highlight uh, some of the things that we're doing for healthcare here in Cumberland County. So I'll hand it over, I believe, Michelle first. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Aaron Smith, who's here. He's the VP of Medicine for Northern Zone. You're welcome to come and join us if you'd, you'd like. There's a spot in the mic, but it's up to yourself. <laughs> so, uh, as Tori said, my name is Michelle Thompson. I'm the MLA for Anaganish. I'm originally from Cape Breton and uh, went to Anaganish to train as a nurse at St. Martha School of Nursing. And, uh, other than a little stint uh, in Scotland, I never, I never left. I found, a, I found a fellow there, so I stayed. So I was really uh, grateful to be elected uh, for the first time in, in uh, 2021 and very privileged and honored to be appointed as the Minister of Health um, in this government at this time. So we, we ran on an, an election platform that we wanted to improve and fix health care. And the first thing we did as we formed government was change the leadership model. Um, Nova Scotia Health and Department of Health and Wellness. Department of Health and Wellness is the funder and the policy maker. Nova Scotia Health is the operator and, and worked really just like the two lines that you see on the floor. Very parallel, um, some intersection. The gap would be wider at times, closer at other times. And so we really felt that in a province our size with the challenges that we had ahead, that it was really important that that team work together to create system change. And so now on a weekly basis, um, Karen Oldfield, Deputy Minister Janine Legasse, Janet um, um, Davidson, uh, who's really a thought leader in our, in our province and our country around health, and Dr. Kevin Oral meet, as well as a number of clinicians, as well as other content experts to make changes in the system. And, our, and while we make change and we want to transform the system, we have to have a bias for action. We cannot wait. We know that the time to change is now. The next thing we did, we hopped in cars and we started in Neal's Harbor in Cape Breton. And we traveled all the way uh, to points in between, including Spring Hill, uh, to, uh, to Yarmouth. And we talked to healthcare workers. We wanted to make sure that our platform was resonated with healthcare workers. We wanted to hear from them about their lived experience. We wanted to hear from them what improvements they felt 
would really make a difference in their work life and in the, in the lives of the patients that they were serving. And so from those uh, deliberations and, and conversations, we built Action for Health, which is the first strategic plan the province has had for healthcare in about a dozen years at least. And accompanying that, if you Google Action for Health, you will find the six pillars that we are committed to transforming, and you'll also find for the first time a website that has accountability metrics. So we wanna tell people how we're doing, sometimes on an annual basis, sometimes on a quarterly basis, what are the things we're measuring, and where we're improving the system, and where the system has not responded yet to our interventions. So we need to be transparent and accountable. It's not always easy. And also you'll see on that website the day before, how the system has performed the day before number of ER visits, um, you know, the number of response times, you'll also see a uh, number of surgeries, et cetera, et cetera. So it, I would encourage you to watch that if you're interested in how things are improving. So now, 15 months in, we're going to communities to talk about some of the changes that we've, we've started, the foundation that we've laid, and we wanna hear from folks what your solutions are, what is your experience, what do you wonder if we're doing, what do you think would help, and so that's why we're here. We have 18 stops, you're 15, I think. This is 15, so really glad to be here. Thank you for coming on such a stormy night. Uh, thankfully, it's not snow. We might not all be getting home. We'd be camping out here for the night. So I look forward to the discussion. This is kind of how it goes. We just discuss once we're done this. We, we seek to answer your questions and, and tell you what we're up to. And we've been able to gather some good ideas, actually, from uh, our, our engagement session. So I really do look forward to, to the conversation tonight. So thank you. Great. Thank you. So hi. Hi there. I, I always like to start by um, acknowledging the healthcare workers in the room. So we, got a, we have a, quite a cast in the back there, and I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. And I suspect we have a few in the up front here too, so maybe a little wave of hands so we see who's here from, yeah, so we do. Great, excellent. And I like to start by, yes, thanking everybody for the work that you do in keeping Nova Scotians safe and healthy. And I also like to remind the public that, um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, our healthcare workers were our heroes. And there were pots banging and flags waving and Tim Hortons cards going out the door. And, and people couldn't say enough good things. And then all of a sudden something changed. And now actually we're fielding a lot of, um, Mm, complaints are probably too strong a word, but there's there's a lot of frustration in our ERs and in our in our sites that sometimes gets taken out on our frontline healthcare workers. And I just remind people to please be patient and please be kind because they we need them. We need you. So thank you. Second thing I want to do is um, I have the opportunity, I guess, to, to ask Debbie and Aaron, if they will take a few minutes and just talk about what's going on uh, specifically here in this community, but the broader, the broader county. Um, yeah, 15 months, my third time in Spring Hill. Um, on that tour, the first tour we did, we did actually Amherst, Parsbroke, Spring Hill. We do have, um, we will be going to Tatamagush after Christmas, I think. But, um, you know, the point being, we're not, we're out and about because we want to know what's going on. We want to see it, we want to hear it, we want to touch it and feel it in the whole kit and caboodle. So, so the minister's been here five times, I've been here three times. I had the, the opportunity, I can't even remember, here in the summer sometime, uh, to meet with the SOS committee and, and broader members of your community. So, um, and really, you know, the purpose of the meeting is to put to put to bed some of the fears that are out there and I, and, I, and I know from the questions that have come in that there's a lot of um, fear and, and people are nervous and so, you know, hopefully we can talk about that tonight and tell you what's in our minds and, uh, and hear from you as well. So, so let's start with a bit of a local flavor and if Aaron and Debbie can share some of the things that uh, they've been doing on any front could be recruiting, could be, you know, any of the hot spots. So, yeah, come on up here, Debbie. Introduce yourself, and I'm sure everybody knows you, but 
Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Debbie Burris. I'm the Executive Director of Health Service. And just a little background, I'm a, I'm a nurse by trade, and I'm entering my 34th year. So it's hard to believe, but uh, very proud of that as well. Um, I have some notes here. It's, it's to remind me, because I've been so involved with the team here, and there's been, you know, we've had our challenges, but we've also um, had a lot of great achievement and um, just the building of the team. And so my responsibility is at the, at the regional facility, and I'm happy to share that we now have a full management team there, and um, we've uh, d recruited them from local, and we've developed our leaders and, and hired them from the front line. So um, I'm really excited that we have a full team there and, and uh, it's the first time in a while that we've had all the positions filled. So some of the things I'm gonna mention are, um, in September we opened a six station dialysis unit at the regional. This is an interim unit. We're in planning for a 12 station unit, but we knew that there was an urgency to set up the, an additional six stations and that um, unit will provide care for up to 24 patients. As of right now, we have 11, and, but that's 11 people that aren't traveling uh, to Moncton or Halifax for their service. So um, I'm very excited that we've been able to set that up. And um, as I just mentioned, we've been, um, as a group, doing um, some functional planning in regards to the 12 station dialysis unit and in addition to uh, having a new emergency department. So that's been really exciting for the team there to be part of the functional planning. And we're just about wrapping up that process. So um, we'll be moving on along in the stages of that redevelopment. And um, probably not a surprise to everyone in May, we had a flood in the emergency department and uh, um, the staff in the and the physicians really rallied around. And it's amazing to think back that we were able to, in less than 12 hours, um, reestablish the emergency department in the ambulatory care department um, and have everything back up and running. Um, and so that's really a testament to the team and their ability to uh, do crisis management as well as uh, pulling that together. And so because of the flood and, and the damage that was there, we thought it was a great opportunity to address some of the, the logistic concerns in the department with uh, waiting room space, uh, team space, uh, eyes on the patient. So we've started a, a redevelopment that we were hoping was gonna be completed in October, um, possibly moving in in November. We've had a few delays, supply chain issues with some uh, pieces of uh, uh, equipment and um, construction that were essential, like fire dampers. But uh, the team that's working on that really has looked at all of the construction projects in the, in the province and has rallied and frowned all kinds of equipment and pulled from other projects. And so we're on track now to uh, move in and have that completed at the end of January into February. So we had a, a town hall about th maybe three weeks ago. And so we talked to the staff at that time and, and talked about the challenges of working in the interim department. And they come up with a few things that were the top of their minds for challenges. And one was a seclusion room for our mental health patients. And the other one was just the congestion in the waiting room and um, as well as the wait time going up. So. Um, We've come together with our contractor and have a, a solution for the seclusion room. And so that, I believe, will be open next week. And uh, right now we're exploring um, bringing in a, a nurse practitioner into the de emergency department during certain times of the week to help relieve the congestion and flow when um, we're seeing the greatest amount of patients presenting. So hopefully, uh, we will uh, be able to get that up and running very, very shortly. And so those were two solutions that, that came from that uh, meeting that we had with the, with the staff and physicians. Um, I also wanted to mention the Cumberland County Bursary. I think that's definitely uh, uh, a very successful program with all of the foundations and auxiliaries contributing um, jointly with Nova Scotia Health. And right now we're supporting four students and we're exploring increasing that to six. 
So um, that's a longstanding program and there are many, many employees that went through and were supported through that. So I just wanted to mention that is unique to Cumberland and, and, and very successful. Debbie, sorry, question. Yes. Um, students of what nature and kind? Like are they nursing students, other professions, or, or what yeah. kind of students? They're, and does it matter? It doesn't, but primarily it is nursing. Um, they support LPN students, they support RN. Um, we have a couple of NP students currently, but in the past they've supported uh, dialysis, or not dialysis, sorry, uh, DI techs and, and lab. And so these are local students that get chosen and support it through their one year, two year, four year program. So it's really, it's really great. I think I'll pass it over yeah. to you now. This is my partner. She's a girl from Spring Hill, I heard. I'm a girl from Spring Hill. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Angela Best. I'm uh, the Executive Director of Community and Rural Health for the Northern Zone. And uh, I'm a Merlin from Spring Hill and uh, very happy to be back in my home community with an office up at the All Saints Hospital. And uh, if you're ever in the area, come pop in and see me. And I'm really happy to share some great news stories um, about what the wonderful things that are going on in Cumberland County. So. <clears throat> um, I'm going to start with the hospital. So we have a collaborative emergency center that continues to operate seven days a week and is very active. Three physicians covering shifts there. Um, we started back in late September to offer uh, an ambulatory care surgical clinics on Wednesday and Thursday mornings. And uh, that's been going well. It started out as a project, but we're looking to expand that further. We also have Dr. Stephanie, Stephanie Aubrey, who provides a pediatric clinic there once a month. We have a very active and stable dialysis unit at the All Saints Hospital. Um, we just recently put in a new air chiller uh, at the tune of uh, $118,000, implemented a security access control system for access doors, panic alarms, and patient wandering. And with the help of the foundation on auxiliary, um, we have uh, been able to purchase $30,000 worth of bariatric equipment and upgrade at the healing garden. Um, and we also have a new site lead that is uh, the manager of the All Saints Hospital and the Pugwash North Cumberland Memorial Hospital, uh, Mary Ann Jackson, who just started uh, the last couple of months. Glad to have her on board. And we uh, have an active posting right now for um, an assistant manager that will also be working under her at, at the hospital. So, great news there. I wanted to mention uh, the new build, the new build that we have going on in Pugwash. Um, we are on schedule for it to open uh, in the spring of 2023. The mechanical rough-in is complete, and we're working on concrete and some temporary asphalt uh, patching. The generator has arrived. It's bigger than we expected, but it's there, and we're glad to have one. Um, we also recently had our MOVE coordination team do an on-site visit and to start to prepare for what that MOVE is going to look like, and we have a completed patient MOVE manual. And we also have the foundation working with us that are going to develop a strategy to capture the history of the old facility as we move into the new facility. So very exciting to get that building in place. The third thing I wanted to mention was the Parsboro Urgent Treatment Center, another good news story. Um, we transitioned to an urgent treatment center there in mid-December 2021. And our goal was to provide a stable urgent care model to the community. It operates five days a week. Um, it's closed on Wednesdays and Sundays. And it allows patients to book an appointment the same day or the next day, and it can be by phone or you can walk in and book an, book an appointment. It's staffed by a rotation of nurse practitioners and locum physicians and has an RN that works um, with the group as well. And between January and August, we had 2,300 patient visits. 
um, and we average about 14 patients a day there. So we did an evaluation over the last couple of months and surveys indicate that there's a high degree of satisfaction with patients and with providers and that the model is very well accepted in the community. So very pleased about that. And while I'm up here, I need more hands. Um, the role that I am in is new. I started in it in July, but before that I worked with public health. And so I just wanted to mention a few wonderful things about public health and considering everything we've been through with COVID. All public health staff are back from their COVID positions that they were reassigned to. We have our early years program has resumed and universal screening in hospital and home visits has started up again. Our health communities team restarted work with our health promoting schools. Yeah, I'm gonna drop one of these. In the page. Our health protection team continues to monitor communicable diseases and outbreaks with the busy respiratory season that we're in right now. We have, uh, in response to hearing citizens having issues booking flu vaccines at pharmacists and at community health care conversations in Truro, we have added flu vaccines as an option with our COVID mobile outreach clinics. Our public health mobile outreach immunization team offers clinics through rural and targeted community outreach three days a week. And the clinics, the mobile clinics offer um, services to temporary foreign workers, Picto Landing First Nation community, Picto Shelter, um, and also works with uh, groups with the African Nova Scotian community. And that's my highlights. Offer to you, so you have one. I'm, I'm glad I get to go last because I have the smallest list of things to remember after all that news from Debbie and Angela. So I'm Aaron Smith. I'm the Medical Executive Director for Northern Zone. Um, so together with Bethany McCormick, who's the VP of Operations for Northern Zone, we're jointly responsible for the administration of health services um, in, in, uh, in Northern. Um, my specific responsibility is around the physician services side and medical affairs, but we, we certainly have pretty fuzzy borders between the operations and the um, in the medical services side. Um, I'm a primary care physician by training. Uh, I practiced in Westville for just shy of 15 years before coming into my administrative role, and I also do ongoing uh, frontline care as a hospitalist. Um, I won't say Colchester Hospital, but I get, I get pulled to St. Martha's every once in a while when they're in a pinch. Um, so I want to just reiterate something that, that Karen has said, um, is that this has been an, un, an unimaginably hard time for healthcare providers um, and for support staff and for administrative staff in the system. This past two years has been incredibly trying and exhausting. Um, and um, the pressures that the team has faced, especially in the Cumberland area, have been extreme. Um, so we've had some things here, some extreme challenges with staffing. Um, we've had challenges with infrastructure. We've had floods in the emergency department. Um, it's it just working under unbelievable pressures. And despite that, um, the teams have continued to provide very high quality um, and, and very reliable care. And that's across all service areas. I see lots of our physicians here, and, and whether it's at the CEC in Spring Hill or the Cumberland Emerge, or if, whether it's in periop services at our regional, um, we keep providing the service to the best of our ability. Um, I want to take a moment and just talk about some of the things in, in, in primary health care um, that we're doing both within the zone and locally. Um, it's no news to anybody that we are challenged with regard to, to folks who are on the Need a Family Practice Registry but it is very important and high priority work. Um, we are working hard to recruit physicians uh, into our system. Uh, we have two amazing recruiters in this zone, Mindy LeBlanc and uh, Lindsay Mattinson, uh, who work tirelessly to identify and speak with and build relations and trust with, with physicians and their families as they come and they, they join our team. Uh, good news on that front is off, we've also just expanded our physician recruitment team. Uh, we have in this zone now, we have three dedicated physician recruitment leads, uh, one in each kind of regional area. Um, and happy to say that in this area, Dr. Janneke Gradstein has, has stepped in and has focused some of her time on physician recruitment. Uh, that's led us to have um, 
great success really around the zone uh, in terms of bringing physicians in. We've had unbelievable success. We have lots of work yet to do, but we have unbelievable success. Um, right here in Spring Hill, we have uh, the upcoming addition of two new physicians. So we have one physician starting with the primary care team in February. We have another slated to um, start a little bit later, I think in the, I think in, f in the fall, so coming up next year. But we continue to have our foot on the gas, and identify and following up any leads we have. Now part of that recruitment work and the success is not only due to, to, to us and the work we do, but it's also really working with communities and community organizations to make sure that as we bring physicians and their families in, um, they're welcomed, they're, they're supported, um, and um, they, they become part of our communities. In this area, we've been really effectively building our partnerships with those community groups and community organizations, and, and I'm really hopeful about, about the future and where that will go. Um, also, just speaking specifically here, um, we have our, we've been working with the primary care clinic here to help them streamline and um, improve efficiency in their administration and their phone system. I said we have a couple new physicians coming, which is great news. I will back up a minute and say, um, the reason why we've been able to succeed to bring physicians to this area and, and really across the zone also is our physicians' willingness to step in and support um, assessment and training of uh, physicians we bring from all over the world. And, and really that, that um, commitment to helping us and stepping up has led to success right here in Spring Hill. I meant to mention that earlier. Um, we also have... Uh, an MP here who not only is supporting primary care, but also is going into the school and supporting our youth health clinic uh, there, which is, is wonderful work. Um, I will also, I know there's going to be questions, so I'm just gonna come right out and say it about the group. One is, there's no active plans to change the CEC. The CEC is the CEC, it's gonna be, um, it's seven days a week, just like it always has been. Um, the other question that I think we may get is, what about the renal dialysis unit here? And I can also stand in front and say there's no active plans to take away the renal dialysis unit here. So I'll just get that out of the way and, and, and say it. And if you, you want to ask again, you can, and I'll, I'll say the same thing again. Um, so um, I'm really interested in hearing your questions and comments tonight. Um, what's really important to me as a, as a leader and as a health leader is that not only do we kind of maintain and continue to provide very high quality services, but we also remain curious about what we can do to improve and innovate and make the system better and better. So these kind of conversations are absolutely wonderful and, and I'm really looking forward to the questions, comments and ideas that, that come tonight. So thanks so much. Thanks Aaron, Debbie, Angela, thank you. Over to you. So now we're off to our questions and answers and I feel like Dr. Smith took some of my thunder with what the, uh, what the questions about repeated oh, questions, but sorry. that's okay, that's okay. So um, you, you can repeat those two for I am, sure. Gonna, yeah. So, um, so the next portion really is a question and answer period. We have a couple of, of uh, things that I want to just mention initially. If you've submitted questions already, I have some of them here so I can read those. If you have a question that you want me to read, you don't want to read it, you can write it on the card that was given to you when you come in and I will read it on your behalf. If you want to ask your own question, totally perfect. Um, we will have some people that will have mics, yep, that will go around and take the mic to you so you don't have to get up. You can sit there, you'll put your hand up. We do, we've done this as, we, as, uh, as was mentioned, we've done a fair number of these and I always say, I know it's not polite to point, but there's no other way I can figure out how to know who I'm calling on. So when you put your hand up, I am going to point at you um, and we'll kind of count off. So I feel like I'm pointing at an auctioneer at the same time. Last night we were at a session that was really busy and I thought people, someone went to scratch and I was like, oh, did you have a question? So I, I, I feel like, you know, at the auctions. Anyway, that being said, the other thing that I would ask um, is that if there are a lot of questions, um, if someone has already asked your question or a very similar question, if you could maybe not repeat it. We, we want to make sure we can get to as many topics as we can and I feel like there's an opportunity here to get lots of conversation and, and answers from this leadership team. So the more different topics we have, um, the more we can get out of it. So I would ask if someone's asked your question or a similar question that you, that you uh, I let someone else go. I will also say, if we run out of time, which can happen as well, please take the card that I mentioned, write your question on the card with your contact information, whether it's an email or a phone number, and someone will get back to you. 
um, I've found actually most of the sessions we've kind of had to cut off at the end and end call time um, with people that still have some questions left and I know that they are getting answers after. So I just want to reassure you that, that you will hear back if you don't get your question, to your question tonight. And I think that's all for my rules. I'm going to actually start with a submitted question. Somebody is, so we have our list of submitted questions uh, already. And I can put my glasses on because I didn't print these ones off. They're very little font. The ones, the ones I print off have really big font. Um, okay, first question. Hmm. When we are so short on doctors, why do we continue to allow the board to license by province? It is time we respect licenses from all provinces and in future negotiate agreements with other countries that have acceptable standards. I'll start and everyone will finish. So I don't know who asked that, but you're right. Um, we do need to look at how we, we currently license uh, physicians and nurses and all kinds of different healthcare providers. So I will say up front that the, the, uh, the role of any professional college is really the public's protection. That is their role. They set our standards of practice and they set our code of ethics. And we do have to come from accredited programs in order to make sure that we provide uh, the best care that we can to Nova Scotians. So that's the, that's the first thing. So as we continue to look at how we can improve efficiencies, we can never allow that to affect the quality of the care that you receive, that I deliver, et cetera. So it's really important that we hold that with the intention that, would, that those colleges are meant to, to give. In saying that, we know that there are efficiencies. And, and there were times and places in history where we could be a bit, uh, you know, maybe a bit more stringent or maybe a bit more picky or whatever the word would be. But we recognize now we are not only in Nova Scotia but in the country and I would argue globally we're in a time and place where we really do need to do things differently. The practice environment that physicians work in today, nurse practitioners, healthcare workers is very, very different than it was 25 years ago and so we need to adapt to do that. We have a lot more uh, senior, our population is more senior. We also have a lot of people living with complex illness, perhaps that weren't, uh, you know, we didn't have the technology or the medications that we had years ago. We also have a workforce, so I was told, uh, you grow up, you get married, you have kids, you get a job, don't change, nothing changes. And we don't see that in our workforce today. We see a workforce that, um, you know, the world is smaller and they want to be able to move around. So economic mobility is really an important uh, aspect for them which means we're gonna to have to deliver care a bit differently. So our premier is very, very uh, directive in terms of his expectation that we look at initially an Atlantic license at a minimum, and then what are the opportunities to, uh, to do a pan-Canadian license for physicians. Similarly, when nurses or um, medical lab technicians or anything like that, any people like that come from an accredited program so we know that they meet a basic level of standard, then we should be able to license them in a timely manner. While we want to grow our own workforce, and I will tell you, if there's young people in your life, there is a job in every community in Nova Scotia for youth in healthcare, whether that be paramedicine, whether that be lab technologist, nurse, physician. There is so much opportunity in our province right now for youth. I would encourage you, and that bursary is amazing. So we do want to grow our own workforce, but it is essential that we look at immigration streams for our healthcare workers to come in and work. And, and, and so we have to look at how we do that. So we are working with our colleges. We are looking at other university programs, not just um, you know, outside of Nova Scotia, but outside of the country, to understand how we can better bring these well-trained uh, healthcare workers to our province. So there is a lot of work that's happening. And I, again, that, that bursary that you have, supporting folks here locally is really important, and working in community to, to welcome newcomers is an essential, uh, it's just an essential uh, habit and, and tool that we need to use in rural Nova Scotia to attract new doctors. Yeah, I, I think I can add a little bit to that, just maybe a bit of a different perspective as well. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to see the movement on the licensure issue. I think it will help us um, recruit and, and stabilize our, our physician group. Um, but in terms of large, the larger kind of viewpoint of healthcare providers, I think it's really important that we encourage and support healthcare workers from all over the world and set them up for success in our system. And I think it's really important not just 
in terms of stabilizing for numbers, but when we encourage and support um, international folks to come and work within our system, we also benefit from the immense um, uh, viewpoints, cultural um, worldview, experience, training, um, and we bring that into our system and we all benefit from it. So I think it, it's a wonderful thing and in, in NSH we're also working very hard to ensure that we're supporting these international recruits for success. I just want to add one thing, which is that um, it's not just the Atlantic colleges that uh, are looking at this. I, I do think we're ahead. I will self tell you that. I think we're ahead because of the leadership taking, taken by our Premier and, and the others here. But um, I had the opportunity within the last month to participate on a call with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, so the national licensing body. And they certainly have been asked to look at this as well. So you just have to read the news to see, you know, this is an issue across the country and so that the, you know, grappling with it quickly and meaningfully in ways that are going to, you know, get out there quickly to people is what we're all trying to figure out. So, so, so we offered, for example, the call that we had with the Royal College. We said straight up, if we give you a resource, will you help to, you know, streamline, work, work with us to help streamline through it? So, you know, in many cases, these colleges don't have a huge number of staff to, to look at some of these issues and work through some of these files. So to me, the shortest way from A to B is to help them. Help them help us. I'm going to ask one, one more submitted question just because I know, um, I think this person is here as well and wanted to be asked. So is there a plan to reopen the recently closed surgical unit at Cumberland Regional Health Center? given there are three general surgeons, one ENT, and two OBGYN surgeons practicing there. All right. Is that Colin? Is that Colin right there? Yes. yes. Okay, Colin. Okay. Well, here, get, get a microphone, Colin. Okay. First of all, you, we can't hear you with your mask on. So, yeah, I, I do want to say that that's why we don't have our masks on up here, because I know we're a masked event, but we discovered early on with the masks, it's, it didn't pick up on the recording. Thank you for taking my question. Um, it's been great to hear of all the positive things happening, but I just want to comment on some of the things we've seen taken away. And I started here in July of 2020 as a general surgeon coming from Dalhousie University, and in that short interval, I've seen the surgical unit closed and then relabeled a med C unit and then filled with ALC patients, and then the government installed a dialysis unit on it, and now where the surgical sign is, it's just bare and empty. And thereafter, you know, the eMERGE flooded, that closed, they moved to ambulatory care. So the reason we're here in Spring Hill doing our ambulatory care surgical unit is because there isn't a safe place to do it at Cumberland Regional. And so my question is, really, is there a plan to close that surgical unit forever? And if there's not, what is the plan to recruit to it, open it, so that the young surgical department that is here can keep working and do good services for Cumberland Regional. Is it okay to stand on this side? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I'll get us started. And um, there, is, there is no plan not to open it, but what we found, and you probably remember this, that because of you know, our, our nursing shortage, that we closed the unit amalgamated it with the medicine so that there's a 40 bed med surge unit and then felt like we had some stability in our recruitment. We opened it back up and quickly had to close again, which is a lot of disruption for patients, families, surgeons, and our staff. So um, w we do plan to reopen it, but not until we have some stability in our, in our nursing recruitment. And so, in the meantime, what we're doing is in the 40 bed med surge, we're making sure we're doing education for the nurses because most of them are, are all new and um, some education around post-op patients and making sure that we have a cluster of dedicated surgical beds embedded in that unit. 
Um, right now, we're taking advantage of having that ALC cluster when our numbers of patients in the building who are waiting for long-term care perhaps are higher than, than they, and that does flux up and down. Um, and the, dia the interim dialysis unit is there. But we are you know, determined to recruit to all of those positions. Um, I'm happy to say we hired two RNs this week, so yeah, that might sound small to folks, but that's a big win um, when everyone's looking for RNs. So I'm, I'm happy to share that. But before we think about opening back up the surgical unit, we need to have stability in the nursing and um, we need to have our numbers and have a few more like supernumeraries so that we can um, respond to the situations where in people, as we heard, we have a mobile staff. So we need to have even more than our core numbers so that we can respond when people want to take other positions and we're not in crisis. So my question is, yes, we're going to open it, but it's going to be like a couple of years is what I'm thinking to get that stability. I hope that we recruit quicker than that, but I want to make sure that we have the staff that we need so that we can open it and stay open. Oh, no, I'm, yeah, go ahead. How about that? Yeah. Start again. <laughs> I have trouble with microphones. Last night I got in trouble because I was holding it up here. <laughs> so I'll try my best. So Colin, thank you for asking that. Um, and, and it gives me a chance to speak to, to another, uh, another issue that's come up, um, which is you know, fears of what's happening with surgical services in Cumberland. And is this, you know, is this, is this a, a move from a, a planning and strategy point of view to reduce surgical services here, which I think is what I'm, I'm hearing through your question. And, and I, you know, we need, we need general surgery here, right? We need general surgery close to home because of your geographic location and the distance to our other regionals and to Moncton. We need general surgery here because general surgery is one of those services that when you need it, oftentimes you need it right away, right? And it saves lives by, having, by being close to home. Um, as Debbie said, there's been extreme challenges with staffing. There's been extreme challenges with the infrastructure of the hospital. We're working through with them, um, but you know, we are committed to have stable surgical services at Cumberland Regional, and, and I can't say it any more clear than that. Um, not only do we need it here, I'll, I'll, I'll brag on behalf of them because they're probably too humble to do it themselves, but they offer amazing services here in terms of weights, outcomes, quality of service. Um, so yeah, Colin, we need surgical services here. There's no plan to shut that down. Could I just mention, I just want to talk a little bit about ALC. So I do want to talk, so, um, ALC patients are people who are waiting for long-term care and I will tell you uh, prior to becoming elected I worked in long-term care for six years as an administrator of a uh, facility so I want to just tell you a little bit about what's happening we now have seniors in long-term care it's a department and one of the things we did just about just over a year ago was we increased the wages for continuing care assistance and it was really important we did that so uh, probably 2019, the years are starting to run together, but probably in 2019, we graduated in this province less than 300 continuing care assistants from the Nova Scotia Community College program across the whole entire province. And that was such a small number that it really didn't affect. And what that meant was that long-term care facilities actually had to close beds because they weren't able to staff them adequately. So as a result of the increased wages, we've also waived tuition for continuing care assistance in order to support their training. We have over 1,000 CCAs, I think it's 1,200 actually, who are in Nova Scotia Community College this year, planning to graduate in the spring. That is such a valuable workforce uh, to our system. They are the backbone, continuing care assistants are the backbone of our long-term care, as well as a lot of our home-based care. So by having that, um, uh, workforce and, and continuing to offer that, we will be able to support um, long-term care facilities in, in taking patients uh, who are sitting in the hospital because we want them in long-term care. We want those folks to live uh, in long-term care where they have recreation and the facilities and the skilled nursing care that they need. 
So I just want to encourage everyone that while we are talking about acute care here this evening, there has been a lot of work started uh, in order to support our long-term care, and their success is our success. So I just want to reassure you that there is work happening there as well, so that when that surgical unit opens, you'll have the beds you need to perform all the surgeries that you need. So we're, we're working on that as well. Thank you. We have a question here, and then, so we have one here, and then two here. You, yeah, thanks. Hi, my name is Sidney Hoxka. I'm a family physician from Amherst, and I've been there for 34 years, and I'm originally orthopedic surgeon by trade. When I heard that two years to open surgical unit here, I got chill on my back because that means that this service, that unit will die by attrition. Because I cannot imagine any surgeon being wait, waiting for two years to get back to the full service. We have a great risk to lose what we have, and if we are not going to have a solid plan to, re to open that service, we are not going to re recruit any other surgeon. And if we are going to lose surgical service, our the regional status of the hospital in Amherst is gone. People, wake up. You cannot come up and tell us that you are going to open a surgical unit in two years. This is ridiculous, I'm sorry. But from the family physician with surgical background, I am just wonder how those surgeons are going to stay here for two years. Because I wouldn't stay here. And if you are not going to open this uh, unit, you are not going to recruit another surgeon. Um, Dr. Biancaski, I, I, can, I can speak to that, and I, I'm hearing... Oh, off again. No. On again? That's the, there we go. Dr. Biancaski, thanks, uh, uh, thanks for bringing that up. And, and as I said, um, there's certainly no plans to close or reduce surgical services at Cumberland. Um, I understand and I hear, and I've heard it from you and I've heard it from staff, and I've also heard it from, from Dr. McWilliams and Dr. Farinick in the room, how difficult the situations they're working are. Um, we have a commitment um, within the zone, and Debbie has sp spoken to it about prioritizing recruitment and trying to stabilize that unit as quickly as we can. In the meantime, I'm also committing to work with the surgeons who are here to try to improve their practice conditions as much as we possibly can focusing on surgical efficiency, focusing on looking at other avenues for them to provide the care that they provide so incredibly well. So it is difficult. It is going to be a difficult situation. We're going to do our best to support the peri-op um, staff here as well as the surgeons and explore ways to offer the services in the interim. I hear your concern. Um, we're doing the best we can and we are absolutely prioritizing recruitment to get the services back as quickly as we can. Yep, and, and as a primary care physician, Dr. Biankowski, I, I completely understand that concern. So thank you. So I, I want to weigh in here because, so I have a huge note with a big asterisk, and, you know, just based on hearing that, um, you know, I, I think there's ways that we can augment help and, and get this to higher on a list of priorities, if I could put it that way, okay? Every community is important, every hospital, every site, of course. Um, but, you know, I look, at it, I look at this part of the province and it goes, in a way, back to the first question because being so close to the border of New Brunswick and very close to Prince Edward Island, it, it, it puts more pressure on the mobility of staff because the next time uh, the province of New Brunswick pays a few more bucks to a doctor or a nurse or a, you know, a dietitian or a lab tech, doesn't matter. Or if PEI does the same thing, everybody says, okay, I'm going. Or it, so that is a race to the bottom. It's a race to the bottom. And it's much better for us to be um, whoever Debbie said at the beginning. So she was happy about the fact that we now have a full leadership team that's homegrown. Great, okay? So now we go to the next problem. This is obviously a pretty big problem. And so we will focus on that problem and we will wrestle the problem to the ground. I think what you're hearing is nobody wants to go out on a limb and say it's gonna be fixed tomorrow. It's gonna to be fixed the next week. 
But what we're all saying is, it's, it's going to be fixed. We're working on it. We're not ignoring it. We're not not doing things about it, okay? I, I heard you, I hear you, and we have it, you know, I won't say under control, but I will say every effort will be expended to get that fixed. I just wanted, I just wanted to add that we are um, making the, the surgical patients a priority on the med surge unit even though we have the medicine and the surgery together, and that we're back to our 2019 service level for periop with that med surge combined unit. So it's not that we have closed that unit and we're not, you, we don't have the same amount of beds. We've had to merge the nursing staff on the medicine and the surgery, surgical unit so that we can do our full sur surgical services. So I just wanted to add that and sorry that I didn't say that in the beginning, that we were able to provide the full service. <laughs> okay, thanks, Debbie. So we have a question here, and then we have someone back over here. John, thank you. We get, yeah, here and then back here. Hello. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Van Boxel. I'm a general surgeon, and as you notice, slightly ancient. Um, I've gone through this in Ontario for 30 five years and then here for 20 years. And um, the, the urgency of getting uh, the surgical unit up is immense. Without surgeons, the emerge will fold and the whole healthcare of this era will disappear. And two years is far too long. We can't wait two years. We have an emerge department that is in a complete mess and we have the committee here arriving in Spring Hill and missing out Amherst. The result is that the nurses in Amherst feel that they're not very important. And I think that that's a mistake. We need to get our unit in Amherst up and running as fast as possible. The eMERGE construction has taken far too long and the not having beds means we'll lose the surgeons we have so painfully recruited. And just as an aside, because it relates to the first uh, question, um, when I moved here from Ontario, I had practiced as a general surgeon with a full FRCS from Canada, from South Africa, in Ontario. And to get into Nova Scotia was actually more difficult for me than getting into Ontario from South Africa. So something should be done. The system doesn't work. I see absolutely no reason why a qualified surgeon from Ontario can't practice here. I do not understand that. And I think we would agree with you, doctor. Our, our premier doesn't understand it either, is what I would tell you. And that's why we're working so hard with the college is really challenging. Why are we, what is the problem, right? And when we actually sometimes refer our patients to Ontario or other places for surgery. So we really have to look at our processes and clean them up. Okay, thank you. There's actually, there's a woman in the back that had her hand up first. So we'll go, oh, it's okay. Well, we got a couple of mics and then and then we'll get you, so that's okay. Thank you, sir. I don't seem to Can you be hold your mic? straight on this. Are you asking questions from the floor, or are you going to ask the questions that you had us submit? We're doing a little bit of both, actually. If you have a question you'd like to ask, you can do that, yes. and we're kind of going back and forth. So if you want to ask one, if you've okay. submitted it, you can that's still that's ask it, and I just want to ask exactly it off the list. That's exactly what I'm going to Perfect. do. Perfect. Okay, thank you. I submitted a, my name is Linda Brown. I submitted a question. There's a rumor flying around that they are going to reduce the RN staff at All Saints Hospital for the month of December from three nurses Monday to Friday to two. And I want to know if that's the truth. I can tell you the answer is no. N O. They're not going to? They're not going to. It is a rumor. I don't know where it comes from. I think every time I come to Spring Hill, I'm dealing with rumors, okay? 
So I'm not quite sure where that rumor is coming from. Now, the, the one other thing that I would like to add to that is, yeah. on the week, through the week, we have three RNs, we have a doctor, and we have a clerk. On the weekends, which are every bit as busy because I'm there every day, there's two RNs, a doctor, no nurse, they take one or no clerk, and we're in the middle of flu season, COVID testing up your yin yang, and today I go in there to get a dressing change, and I'm not complaining because when I go there, I expect to wait anywhere from an hour to five, and I don't complain. Today I go in, because I don't need to see the doctor today, I go in about five after one, and I knew when I went in, there was a car drove in the emergency right in, and I thought, something bad there, gonna be delays. There was about 20 people in the waiting room. I went in, sat down, they come out about 20 minutes later and said, Linda, and they went to another gentleman that was there for a dressing change. We're going to be at least 4.30, 5 o'clock before we can even get to you because we have two emergencies we're handling and all these people. And it's the same on the weekend. I don't know what you expect doctors and nurses to do, but I'll tell you, there's very few of us who could keep up the pace that they keep up up there. And thank you. No, thank you. Do you want to address the, the sure. issue? Sure. Hi, well, thanks for your Thanks for that. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry that you had to wait. Um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, people are working their fingers to the bone, okay? So that, that we can agree. And finding the relief valve and finding the help is the top priority. Thanks for your question, Linda. And I would say that uh, the staff at our CEC and in All Saints are doing a phenomenal job. They're busy. You know, we have a lot of we have a lot of patients coming through there. Our doctors and our nurses are very busy there. Unfortunately, we have a health care human resource crisis as well. And so we don't always have the staffing we'd like to have. And certainly when you get into things like Christmas holidays, sometimes we have to rejig some of our staffing in order to get the proper coverage. And that's not just at All Saints, that's at all our facilities. So there's absolutely no intention to cut staffing at the CEC in, in Spring Hill. Um, but we do have to look at the resources that we have and do the best we can with what we have. And, and, and that's what we do every day. So I appreciate your, your question. And uh, I, I agree, sorry that you had to, to wait so long but it does just give you an example of the workload that uh, is coming through that facility and the reason why we need to, to keep it going. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I feel like a bit of a unicorn in this room. I think I'm surrounded by medical types and I'm not. I'm an engineer, technologist, and a programmer. Uh, I started working at Toronto General Hospital working to install and service x-ray machines that helped install the first MRI there, anywhere in Canada. Uh, that was a long time ago. Uh, since then, I've been working in engineering all the way up to now, and I just spent six years in Los Angeles running engineering teams. So I put it, just putting it in context, what I'm gonna say. So I run in the middle HMO that I go to when I'm down there. I go in to see a doctor. I don't see the doctor, I see the doctor's assistant. The doctor's assistant interviews me Gets all the information. I see the doctor for four minutes, maybe. And you know why? Because the doctor has everything they need to go. And I'm gone, number one. And then I go for blood work. There's no line. I go straight to the counter. And then they take me straight over to take my blood. And that blood work goes to automation, a machine. It does not, you know, here from what I can see, and it's about three weeks, I think, to get blood work done here. On average, last time I screwed it up, so I waited five. Um, there it's five minutes. And by the time you're in your car going home, you're getting 80% of the results in a text, which links to their database, and they tell you the ones that are gonna take two days or three days. And you already know all your answers. You've, the doctor told you in the four minutes the answers you wanna get. 
I say all that to criticize nobody. I'm an engineer. Technology solves a lot of human resource problems. Investing in automation will solve a lot of problems. It's not going to solve wait lists for surgery. I get that. But what it is going to solve for you is people's, the, the value of the bandwidth of the people you have working for you, what they can get accomplished in a day. Um, so I just wanted to put that on, on your, in a room full of decision makers, I wanted to put that right on your agenda too, please, right on the table, that you can find a lot of efficiencies with technology. Are so. there any healthcare workers in here who would like to beef up their technology? <laughs> okay, I rest my case. So, so uh, you know, you're talking my language, and and any healthcare worker in the room, any most in the province will say, we're kind of behind the times. And there's been, uh, you know, many different systems that don't talk to each other. We're still on facts. There's a lot of paper. You know, the EHS people will tell you, in doing a patient transfer, there's a there's a piece of paper tucked under the foot of the person that's being transferred and transported, so you're lucky if the paper ends up in the same place as the person. So, and we could go on. There's a lot of stories, and, and, and why I like your question is because, um, you know, it has come up at, at pretty much every single town hall. And so, uh, there's a couple of things on the go. Um, it, 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 your question touches on efficiencies, it, technology, scope of practice, so maybe we could just talk about each of those because I think they're important. So on the technology side, it's been one of our priorities and in fact it's in the minister's mandate to get this OPOR1 patient one record done. So I would just say stay tuned. Everybody hears us say stay tuned, but this time I really mean it. Stay tuned. Um, so, so that will help a great deal, there, and you will get that on your phone, and you will be connected, and everybody else will be connected. So we'll, we would start first within the, the NSH system, uh, and then um, tacking in. So, so a family physician, for example, would be able to see in, but not necessarily uh, be connected into that system. But, but there will be so much more information available to everybody at a finger, at a at a touch. Um, and you know, that is so important for recruiting and retention. Because if you think about our students who are graduating today from medical school, nursing school, anywhere in between, or any other student from high school, they, they have come from, you know, they don't know pre-internet. They don't know pre-mobile phone. Like their whole life is in their hand. And, and so, you know, any province, any community, any city that wants to recruit young people needs to be able to attract them in, and help them and support them and put them in a work environment where they understand the tools. Like my kid would not know how to use a fax machine. So, so that's a second piece. Uh, the efficiencies, I'll just, sh I'll just share this one story that will kind of roll into scope of practice and then the minister perhaps can um, add a little bit there. So in this time last year, we um, wanted to ha work with uh, Dalhousie Family Medical Clinic, which NSH and Dalhousie are in partnership at that clinic. And we wanted the clinic to take more patients from the list. So we asked Dalhousie, can you do that? Sure. Give us a few months, we'll do a proposal, and we're probably going to need 13 more people and $26 million. Yeah. That's not a good answer. Okay? That's not where we want to start. So what we did together, we put a team together and sent the team in, and the team included two industrial engineers, so we have a team of 20 industrial engineers in the province that are looking at these efficiencies every day. In that particular case, two went in, and, and, and um, the team uh, comprised of both Dalhousie and NSH. On the se second day, they said, listen, we can take 2,500 people off the list, and we're not done yet. 
they finished the fourth day, they could take 3,500 people off the list. And they also found a new and improved way of putting res family medical uh, residents through the clinic to better prepare them for their own practice. And one of the things we learned, uh, so you saw your doctor for four minutes, because tick, 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 everything else was done in advance. Of course, that's the way it should work. So one of the things that we uh, learned from this process and have put in place is what we call a rapid onboarding team. And the rapid onboarding team looks at the schedule, make sure that everybody's working to their full scope of practice, that the right person is doing the right thing. And one of the things that we learned uh, conclusively is that it takes approximately 60 to 90 minutes to onboard a new patient to do that complete history. So the right person should be doing that history. It is a huge um, dissuasion for a family physician, for example, to take 90 minutes out of a day to bring on new patients when they could use that no same 90 minutes to see so many more patients. So, so who should be doing that onboarding? So we got that fixed in this, in this clinic. And now this is a team that is available to physicians in the province. We're gonna scale this model. We're gonna take that rapid onboarding team, use it in our other primary care clinics, and use it for family docs who, who think they might want that kind of help if they want it. So it also uh, brought to light the challenges that we have around scope of practice, and I'll maybe just ask you, Minister, to uh, talk about that, and if you don't want to, I can keep going. I'll, I'll start, and you can fix where I miss. So to your point around who is the right person to do the work, years ago it was very linear. Like as a nurse, the doctor told me what to do and I did it most of the time. Uh, and uh, you know, kind of went from there. So now what we see is our, as our health professionals have changed, their scope is really broad. And physicians now want to work within a team. So family practice nurses, nurses, licensed practical nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, uh, where you have a couple of pilots going, one in orthopedics and one now in the emergency, one of the emergency rooms to look at physician assistants. And also when we bring internationally trained graduates into the, into the country, if they can't fully uh, register or license to the degree at which they practice in their previous uh, home, can we bring them to a clinical associate level? and pharmacists and how do we work in a team. So before, um, we use the analogy we could do this much, but when we maximize scope of practice, we can now do this much and see that many more people. So all of this stuff is moving forward at the, at the same time. And so to all of your points, those are the things that are gonna start to materialize and make a difference in the next you know, 12 to 18 months. You're, we're really expecting to see a big impact. And then the other thing I would say, around when you said, you, you know, Technology can't do surgery, but luckily we have robotics actually now in Halifax. And so some of the orthopedic surgeons are actually doing some work with robots and making, you know, like, you know, very first in Canada type of surgery as a result of that. So it's better outcomes for patients and all kinds of things. And uh, the technology that we have, pretty significant. Uh, we have a new uh, 3D imaging machine that sees a tumor, allows us to radiate it, and then as the tumor changes, it continues to take images, so the radiation is specific. So we want to be leveraging that all the time. It's a huge recruitment tool. So we do actually have some technology doing surgery. So it's good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're on, on the, the path. <laughs> we're on the bit, that's for sure. But, um, you know, um, we had to dig down, and it was a pretty deep well, and when we got to the bottom, it's a long climb out. It is a long climb out, and uh, it's a long climb with people who have, are exhausted. So we also had to be careful not to break our people. That's, that is very important. It is very, very important. Uh, so, you know, I want to I make sure that people um, see light at the end of the tunnel, that they have hope, and, and that is not just our healthcare workforce, but people, like, we do see light. We see light. But, but doing this, doing this is so important because we don't see everything. We don't know everything. And, you know, I, I wanna, I wanna we wanna hear. I could just 
add one thing to that too. Um, I, I love your question. Um, I was in a primary care practice that had an actually industrial engineer come in and, and, and look at process mapping and, and I mean, it was invaluable. Um, just picking up your point about going, getting the results back and, and, and what that felt like within minutes. Um, I, I said this at the meeting last night, the, the future of quality care is digital. Right, it is, um, and, and not just in terms of making sure providers have the information they need when they need to make critical decisions, but also a digital health strategy and digital health information strategy really democratizes healthcare. And what I mean by that is, you are the owner of your health information, um, and when you have access to it in a way that you can understand and is usable for you, it helps you and your provider make the decisions that are right for you. So, really, a digital health information strategy not only improves quality care, but also improves people's understanding of their own health care and the health system. So I think it's a really important point you made. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe that's a good jumping off point to actually talk about the list, and, uh, so our needed family practice list and virtual care and other aspects of technology. So, and, and it touches on several things in the province, and we certainly recognize that not everybody has a computer, not everybody has the internet, not everybody has access to these things and, and don't want to. So, you know, uh, Aaron just said the future is digitization and the future, like there is a lot of technology wrapped up into the future. So that's great for the kids. What about the rest of us? Um, so I will just share that, uh, I don't know if there's anybody here tonight with Virtual Care Nova Scotia, VCNS, but any, any person who is on the Need a Family Practice Registry is able to sign up for virtual care. If you have any trouble whatsoever, there are people available tonight, but at all times, to help to do that. And if you sign up and you want to um, have uh, care provide, you need an appointment, then you would arrange for the appointment virtually on the computer. You would have your appointment. It would either be with a nurse practitioner or a, um, a physician, and they would either prescribe or they would refer you to a specialist or potentially your problem, need, you need to go to the eMERGE, or they would say you need to be seen. So you would be seen same day next day at a primary care clinic and until you become um, attached to a, you know, a, a physician or, or a nurse practitioner, that primary care clinic is, is your health home. So this is very important. People need to understand that. Um, the, why, why I raise it is because in other communities, uh, so for example in New Glasgow, the Aberdeen Hospital Foundation has worked with the public library to set up a virtual care station, a kiosk. So there, there, I don't know what you have here in Spring Hill or if there would be any interest of any groups to do that. But to me, in, when you have a community with, let's just say, an aging demographic, it's probably helpful to have people who can help with this. Okay, because it's not always easy. So they did it in New Glasgow uh, through the foundation and also in Bear River and also in Yarmouth. So three places where the foundations have partnered with, a, uh, in, the, in two cases, a public library, and I don't know where it's going in Yarmouth. But, so it's a, it's, um, it's a positive, it's helpful. Uh, the other part of it is, sometimes, and, I, and you know, I do get this once in a while, uh, that people go in and to virtual care and all the appointments are taken. That's not always the case. Sometimes you just have to go in after five minutes. I, d I don't know why that is. It's a bit of a glitch, so we're looking at it because we don't really know why that is. So I would just encourage you, if you did have a, ch if you went in and it looks like it's completely blocked, just wait a few minutes and go back in. Try it again. Anything you want to add to that, Minister? Okay, so we have, um, yeah, J maybe a mic, maybe a mic. Around and we'll get them spread out around the room. I'll be super fast. And I imagine a lot of people will agree with me. Uh, I came from another country here. 
came from the United States directly to Nova Scotia. I'm Canadian, by the way. Nobody turned my car. Um, I got a doctor right away while other people are waiting on the list. People coming from out of country don't go on the waiting list. They get doctors immediately. I've waited three weeks to get a, uh, an MD. Um, it's kind of screwing myself by saying this, but that's ridiculous. I should have gone to the back of the list and then the back of the back of the list. People who are already here who are waiting should get the doctors first. Just whatever, whatever made that rule, someone should burn it, move on. <laughs> Just wanted to say that. Well, you, you may have just hit it lucky. So one of the things that we recognize with the Need of Family Practice Registry is it really is just simply a list. And we need a better functioning list. We need to understand, we need to be able to triage people. We need to know how, you know, when you, were on, when you got on the list, why are you on the list, all types of things. So it's one of the things that we're looking at with our digital solutions, and we want you to be able to update. So I may be fine and well right now, but if something changes, I need to be able to update that so that we can understand who needs the list. So similarly how do we triage people to make sure that those that need a physician or a family practice or a health home get to it first so the functionality of that list is very 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 limited and uh, not helpful so it's one of the things that we're looking at um, just to better understand I'm not really sure how you lucked out on getting that person yeah there's That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we're not accustomed to in Nova Scotia, I would say. Like, we, we've had the same, many of us have had the same doctor from the time we were born. They deliver, like, you know, they deliver everybody in the community and then they go on to deliver the people's people. Like, it just goes on forever. But those legendary physicians are, those, that practice is, is gone now. So what we need is for people to have a health home. And when we talk about uh, that uh, Atlantic or Canadian licensure, and we know that younger people, newer graduates want to move, we're going to probably all be attached to a health home. And our physicians and our nurse practitioners may be all locums, and they're going to come in, and they're going to come out, and they're going to come in. But we know that we can access care. And attachment and access are not the same thing. So we have people who are attached who wait, six, who wait four or five weeks for an appointment, which is why we want to optimize practices wherever we can. Okay, we have a question here and then we have here. So I think we've got one and then two. Good evening, my name's Melissa Kingen. I've, I've met some of you already previously with the SOS committee. Um, we hear of major disruption with the regional hospital surgery unit, um, chaos of the ER system. We know that Spring Hill Pugwash has been taking on a massive onset of overload patients, which is a huge asset. But one thing we also, I don't know if we've considered, but I know Dr. Ferguson is one of them. Um, he's soon looking at retirement. We have to look at re recruiting doctors to replace that, start training them for emergency departments. Um, but on top of that, we take a look at Sackville, New Brunswick. They were facing a major um, issue, similar issue, staffing issue. Um, I've been, been in touch with many of them. They've come together with the hospital staff, the community members, the municipality, and they've worked together. They've done a phenomenal job of recruitment. And so I guess my major question is, what can we do, um, not just as individuals, groups, but to help bring people in for, to do the surgical unit? Do we need volunteers in the hospital now to get back to opening things up and yeah. assisting with that? Is that something that we can do and work together? Because it feels like, as you've said, you've been here three, five times, and we're all talking, and we're in worse shape than we were before. We need to move now before we lose what we have. And, and I think working together is the key. So I, I really, I like what you say. So, you know, I don't know if anybody, I, I don't know if the um, if information morning it plays the same here in Spring Hill as it does in Halifax. But this morning, as an example, they had their um, uh, um, community yes, community contact. I was trying to remember the name. The community contact from Middleton was on the radio. Did anybody happen to hear that this morning? No. Okay. And the entire interview uh, that uh, today, Middleton, was about their community group that came together to really support the recruitment 
Uh, so they, what had happened in Middleton was that they lost um, six family doctors within a short period of time because they were all from a class or a vintage. And so, you know, all of a sudden there was a massive loss in Middleton and the surrounding area. So same thing, what can we do? And they banded together. They have a heck of a group that's doing everything you can imagine, okay? Wrapping arms around families, to, uh, working with the recruiters to, you know, introduce them to local businesses, show them the schools, you name it, soup to nuts. So I was so, actually, I was so impressed by the interview. I, ca I called our PR folks and said, like, get the clip of the interview and, and do something with it. Because, well, they're, they're very proactive. And, and that is exactly how you recruit to a community, okay? It's not just one person or one, you know, it's not Aaron, it's not Karen, it's not Debbie, it is the group with a plan, with a plan. So, you know, I'm just gonna leave that with, with you. But you can start it. You don't need to wait for us. You can invite us, is what I would say. So a lot of these community groups um, have started on their own, and now the Office of Healthcare Professional Recruitment has community grants so that you can apply um, and get a community grant. Maybe you want promotional material about what you're out, maybe you want to do a video, maybe you want to do whatever, and there's becoming a network. So usually the municipalities are involved as well, and there's lo like your group, right, would be a perfect opportunity to partner and, and, and connect with the recruiters and then you move it. You don't have to wait for us because we've got a ton, but we'll always help you and, and happy. And when we lead it, it's very different than when you lead it. When the exactly. community leads it and owns it and welcomes and says this is what we need and this is what we want, and any opportunity we have, that's why we have those community grants. It's a $2 million fund for the whole province. And also, once you get started, those, those recruiters, you just build on one another's successes. And it just creates this momentum and momentum and momentum. So, you know, um, don't... Don't wait. Don't wait. Do you, you're passionate. We've met you before. I see a few folks. Like, we want to help you. It's not... And I mean, I'm all in. We're working really hard. We're all working, but it's not just one of us. Like it's it's so, all of us. So, so yeah. I'll just you know, as I as we have gone around the province, like different communities do different things. Great. So South Shore, uh, we were in Lunenburg. They the South Shore uh, Regional Hospital Foundation has recently funded its own recruiter because they think it's important. So that's what they decided to do. You have bursaries here, fantastic. So is there, you know, is there a way to broaden that? Do we, re do we pivot and look at doing something else with the same dollars? We are limited only by the imagination and we do not have every good idea, but we can put you in touch with these amazing people who are doing amazing things around the province. So, you know, and they 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 exist. So, Picto, what's it called, uh, Aaron? Healthy Healthy Picto. Uh, uh, healthy Picto County, yeah. And it's a it's a community group um, that has come together, and they've jointly with the, with actually the medical staff at the at the Aberdeen Hospital have jointly funded what they call a community uh, recruitment navigator, and it was originally focused on physician recruitment um, and. and um, has expanded the mandate a bit to really support healthcare recruitment in general in the community. So it, it's been an, an amazing story of success and the community and the, the medical staff together have, have committed to fund that on an ongoing basis. Um, I, I can add a, a few things too from the physician recruitment perspective because I, I agree with everything you said. Um, we had a meeting with the recruiters and the physician recruitment leads lately, um, our first actual meeting as a group and we said, really, what does success look like, right? And, and, you know, the first obvious answer was, well, success is getting more physicians here. I'm like, yeah, 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 of course that is. But what does success really look like? How do, and how do, we, how do we accomplish that? Um, and the reality is, is that well, very, very few times do we ever just recruit a physician, right? We recruit families, right? And we have to support families. And we have to support families in the context of community, 
education, um, you know, jobs, and we also have to provide appropriately safe spaces for people of diverse backgrounds to live and thrive in our communities, right? And some of, so some of that's ours, absolutely, but a lot of that's communities. Um, so in our group, we said one of the key factors for success for us as a physician recruitment group is to go out and make meaningful connections and build relationships and build trust with community groups. We have to. So, um, you know, we will be in touch <laughs> around physician. The other part I just want to say quickly, because I, I just want to brag about it a little bit, um, is um, you talked about training and, and how do we get, you know, trained physicians to, to come in to the spots of, of previous physicians. Um, one of the great stories of success in, in Northern Zone here is our, our um, North Nova Residence Training Program. So we've started that across the zone. It has some feelers out into Eastern Zone a little bit into, into St. Martha's, but we train family medicine residents all across our zone um, right here. And we've had residents um, at all three of our regional sites. We're pushing them out in the community. We had an amazing story of success with a resident that did their training in Tadamagush, and they actually recruited, and that physician is staying there. And we're interested in having those conversations about how we can support those educational opportunities in small, uh, and, uh, small sites and our regional sites right across the zone. As it stands now, we have six new family medicine residents starting every year, and that number is due to increase. So uh, it makes me really hopeful, too. So thank you. And, and I just asked Debbie to speak to the volunteer aspect yeah. and, you know, the importance of our volunteers back in our hospitals. So we are welcoming our volunteers uh, back into the hospitals and the rural sites, and, and we're very excited. Um, through COVID, some of their numbers have dropped, and of course they have concerns. Um, a lot of our volunteers are, um, you know, elderly that have comorbidities, so of course they have concerns, and I know they're working, um, our volunteer coordinators are working to support them and make sure that they feel comfortable coming back, but definitely we're, we're welcoming them back. And the other thing I wanted to mention in, is, is what I'm familiar with with the Amherst group. So Mayor Gogan and his wife Debbie um, have a, a, a recruitment, a community recruitment strategy. I know that they're working hard at, on that and you know, have lots of great ideas on supporting with um, potential you know, housing solutions and, and wrapping those supports around um, families and, and, and staff that are coming and, and getting recruited. So they would be a good resource for anyone to reach out to because I know that uh, Debbie, of course, has been um, involved in it for years, so. Maybe touch on um, retention. I'm surprised it hasn't come up. Uh, and I'm thinking in specifically uh, with regard to nurses. So we've talked a little bit about nurses. And um, again, when I think about this part of the province and how close it is to New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island, I can imagine that, you know, it's, um, it is a challenge. So retention, um, it's such a challenging area. And one of the things that um, Bethany, who unfortunately not able to, to be here tonight, but she and the team have started to conduct, started to conduct what we call stay interviews. So making sure that um, we reach out, what makes you stay? What would make you go? Like why, why, why do you stay? So that we ensure we know, like why do people stay, why do they go? And everybody has a different story. It's family, um, they love it, they love the work, they, you know, whatever, like much of it is personal. And so we really have to understand and work with as many um, of our staff as possible because it doesn't take much for a person to say, you know what, the grass is greener on the other side. I could be a travel nurse. I could go to Newfoundland and have a huge retention bonus or whatever it happens to be, okay? So, so we, we have started that. Um, we've actually started it in the western zone, morphed it over to the northern zone so that we have a pretty good feel for why people stay or why they go. And now the next trick will be to tr try to find ways to um, make the job a little bit, uh, how would I put this? We're almost trying to create a travel nurse uh, scenario within 
the health authority. So in other words, why would somebody go be a travel nurse? Well, their hours, what they have the weekends off, or they don't have to do, um, you know, they don't have to do as much overtime. They don't have to do overtime every day. There could be any number of reasons. So the more we can identify why somebody would want to be a travel nurse and, and bring that into our system, the better off we are going to be. I'm not explaining that very well, and I apologize. It's, get, it's uh, been a long day, and I'm sorry. Uh, so we, we, I guess what I'm trying to say is we, we have to do a better job of meeting people where they are. Like, I need this, this, and this. Okay, great. Let's try to, pr let's try to give you this, this, and this. Um, that's not an easy thing to do, especially when we're talking about, you know, un a unionized environment with collective agreements and the whole kit and caboodle. Not an easy thing to do. So we're heading into bargaining with, with nurses as one group. And so, you know, collective agreements that are 30 years old, 40 years old, they, they, they may not have all of the tools that we need to um, keep our workforce happy and intact. So, you know, it's not all about the money. Of course, compensation is important, but all of these other things are very important too. It's not very fun if you have to work all the time. Hey, thank you. We have a couple of more questions. I think we probably only have time for a couple more questions because these have been really thorough. It's been good. Lots of good questions. So we have, why are you here? And then we have someone back here. And again, if we don't get to everyone, please write your question on a piece of pa on the paper and, and uh, with your name and number, we'll make sure we'll get in touch with you. So we'll go here first and then over here. Hi, uh, it's Andrea Farnick. I'm one of the surgeons in uh, Cumberland. Um, I'm curious to hear uh, what the future strategies are for what I perceive to be a future problem, if not a current problem. And it's, it has to do with rural specialists. So um, I can only speak in the surgical world and a little bit about my experience in Cumberland, but manpower is an issue for a, a multitude of reasons. So in Cumberland, we have three surgeons and we have just enough elective surgical work for three surgeons. But because we only have enough elective surgeon, uh, surgical work for three surgeons, those three surgeons then have to take on all of the call duties. And not only do we take on all of the call duties, we also take on all of the assisting duties. Um, because we strongly believe that good surgical outcome often comes in a two-surgeon system. Um, but this is an unsustainable model um, because it's way too much on call demand but if we recruit a fourth surgeon we don't actually have enough regular surgery for them and then remuneration in a land of fee for service becomes problematic so it's it's a very multi-level problem it's not only a surgical problem it's an internal medicine problem everybody has to find their fee for service niche um, in order to make ends meet, but also to cover the call so that you're not burnt out. We have two obstetricians, one of which I think does 21 hours of on-call a month, which is mind-blowing. You will never recruit a young individual to that model of care. But there's actually not enough regular work in the gynecological world in Cumberland to have three or four obstetricians. So it's going to have to be a unique model. It's going to have to be um, compensatable. It's going to have to be job satisfaction. If I only get to do five colon operations because there's five of us, I will not keep my skills up so that it will remain competent to do such a technically difficult operation. Um, and the new generation, they're not like the Dr. Van Boxels who worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and, and, and did it selflessly. We're, we're a little more selfish than that. We wanna know our families, we wanna do other things. And I feel it's a multifactorial problem, it's very complex, and I'm just curious 
Well, I know you're aware, you're shaking your head, of course you are. I'm just wondering what the strategies we're thinking about to combat this problem in rural Nova Scotia. Where to begin? <laughs> you're the doctor, you start and then we'll, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Andrew, I, I agree with everything you said. And I know I said that before, but I do. And, and I don't know what surgical call feels like, but I know what call feels like. Um, and I know what it feels like to assist at three in the morning. Did it for years and years and years. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's an issue. It, it absolutely is an issue. And I agree that it's potentially destabilizing for rural specialist care. Um, I agree with you that the payment structure is limiting in terms of what we can do. Um, and certainly advocate for change in supporting the departments where we need to. We've had some movement on that already with, with cooperation from our DHW colleagues. I think we still need to look at that and we need to make sure that we're, we're correctly identifying that as, as a destabilizer for future care. I know I'm using lots of big words there, I'm sorry, but it is a risk. Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, I, and I don't want to overpromise here, but I can tell you, and I, I can't imagine I cannot imagine being on call 21 days out of a month. Um, and even if, you know, in that 21 days, as you've said, maybe the service level isn't high, but you're still giving up all the things that you would normally do, right, in that time. Um, and I don't think also that you need to be apologetic for saying I want to do those things, right, at all. And I heard you say that, but you don't, I mean, it's, we wouldn't expect that of anybody. So, you know, I firmly want to advocate for what we can do to support our rural emergency, our rural specialist uh, groups uh, uh, across the zone. So I don't have an answer for the fix right now, but I do recognize it as a problem. So, I, um, so my wheels are turning, 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 turning. So I think one of the things after Karen speaks is you really, I think it's important that you, as a team, you think about that. Like, what would that look like? And I'm, you know, I'll say stuff here, it's not written in stone, what about an RN first assist? What would that program look like up here? What would it look like if we kind of decided that we wanted um, um, primary care obstetricians? Like, what, it, like, we kind of have to dream it and then build to it, right? So, I think often what we've done in the past is this is the model and let's pound everybody into the model. And so that's not helpful, but if you think it's pretty unique here, you're a little bit far away, you're close to New Brunswick, but you know, maybe it is something that you want to dream about here that you know works somewhere else. And what I can't promise it's going to happen, but could we, could we talk about what it would look like so that you, know, you don't have to assist one another if, if it's a relatively straightforward case. Things like that, you know? What are the things that we can offer when we are recruiting GPs? Do we want to look for someone that has an obstetrical background or palliative care or hospitalist or, you know, I think we really have to kind of name what, what would be helpful here and, and try and find it because, it, you know, there's a lot of opportunity. So that, you may be the perfect fit for somebody who doesn't currently see themselves in the model that you have is what I would say without over-promising, but I think it's really something that you guys could generate and we could discuss, or that you could discuss with Karen and him. <laughs> so I don't know, like, Karen will finish, but I just think it's important to think like that. You know, what are the opportunities and, and what do you know from other places? Because this is the time, I think, for us to kind of imagine what it could be. And I'll just add before Karen, Dr. Dr. Fairnick, um, on the RN First Assist, we're about to press play on that in the Aberdeen right now. So. Absolutely happy to explore what the art of the possible is at this site with you. What you're hearing from um, Aaron and the minister is everything's possible. And, you know, the more, the more we can get communities, groups, um, specialists, family practitioners, the more we can get people thinking that, the faster we can help. Because my brain's only big so big and we are doing a gazillion things okay gazillion everybody is but but you're focused on your thing and I want to help you so if you have ideas like you must talk about stuff at the water cooler or when you're on call or whenever and so um, we have so many ways that we could help so for example we have um, a whole group at Nova Scotia Health called research, innovation, and discovery. And we, we have um, a couple of folks who specialize in models of care. 
So, so let's just say you had a question. What, what are we doing for rural specialists across Canada? And you wanted somebody to chase that down. We can do that. We can chase it down. The, the helpfulness of that is, uh, so we call that a rapid review. The helpfulness of that is, you look and see, oh, here's what they're doing in Manitoba, here's what they're doing here, particularly parts of Canada where there are some very rural um, areas, and maybe we get an idea. Like, that is how I start many of my problem solves. So, so uh, you know, not to say we, we can't um, work together, uh, but just simply to say, if you guys already have an idea, we can work with it. Um, you know, we can, work, we can work with any idea that's worth chasing down. The, the other thing I wonder about is when we get to the place of single entry referral, right? So we get a point of e-referrals and single entry referral. And so our GPs from across the province are looking and they're looking around surgical wait times and saying, okay, who has capacity? Where is the latent capacity? So referral pathways will change as a result of that, right? So you, if you want your orthopedic surgery from this doc, you may have to wait this long if that's your choice. But if you are happy to go where the next available spot is, your wait time is this. And so currently there's no line of sight into the latent capacity that the team may have. And perhaps there is room for another person. I don't know that. But these are some of the innovations to leverage technology to say, is there a line of sight? So where there is latent capacity, OR time is a premium in most spots. So if there is opportunity and we do have this, you know, all those things fall into place, then there may be opportunity here that we haven't yet realized because we're in that antiquated system, which is another option. Do you ever feel like you're interrupting a party when you have to stand up and moderate this and say it's almost 8 o'clock and that means we're dying, our time is up, unfortunately. And so I know that means we're not going to get to all the questions that people have and I'm really, really sorry. And I am going to ask you to please write your information on your card um, and with your name, email if you have it, phone number if you don't, someone will follow up with you. Um, I know that I have a submitted question that was asked to be read. If that's whoever that is, if you want to come talk to us, I actually think I can provide you some information on that. So um, again, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone here for coming out. This is our last one before a break and then we come back on the road in January. And uh, it's so wonderful to see people come out on a dark rainy night and have an opportunity to ask some questions. And I, I, every time we do this, I also have, I, I know they, they, anyway, but I always have to commend uh, our leadership team for coming out and being asked questions, not knowing what they're gonna be asked and being willing to uh, come out and, and, and hear from what communities have to say. And uh, so I always say it takes courage to come out and ask hard questions and it takes courage to answer the questions. So thanks everyone for coming and uh, safe travels. And I know there'll be lots of stuff to come and make sure you fill out your forms, please. And thank you if you have questions. Thank you.